welcome to the Universal Dancer podcast with your host, Leslie Zare, author of The Alchemy of Dance and The Alchemia Remedies, coming to you live from Cairo, Egypt, the ancient land of Ken. Journey with us to explore sacred dance, the sacred arts, the mystical and the magical. Join a community of like-minded souls seeking to understand the cosmic dance of co-creation through the sacred arts. Come along and expand your mind, ignite your creativity, and explore something new and something old. Welcome. Welcome to the Universal Dancer podcast. And today my guest is Melissa Michaels. Before I introduce her, I would just like to say that uh, thank you all for the comments, the feedback, and just to remind you that all the podcasts are on the major podcast platforms and also on YouTube, we have all the previous episodes. So if you haven't seen them, please have a look. And please like and subscribe. That helps other people to find the videos, to have them come up for them in searches and as a live broadcast. So uh, that helps. And the same thing on the podcast. If you liked it, then please let us know. Share it with your friends. We're building a community here of like-minded people. So we want other people to be able to find us as well. And if you have comments, questions during the recording, please put them in the chat. And also after the program, if you have questions or comments, put them in the comments and we can get back to you. I'm always notified when there's a comment, so I would be happy to answer questions at any point in time. Okay, so let's get into our talk today with our guest. So let me introduce Melissa to you. My guest for this episode of the Universal Dancer podcast is Melissa Michaels. Melissa is the founder and director of Soma Source Educational Programs, Golden Girls Global, and Golden Bridge, a not-for-profit organization dedicated to improving and empowering the lives of people through body-centered, initiatory processes, mentoring, and community action. For more than 34 years, Melissa has been creating movement-based cross-cultural educational opportunities focusing on the potential that is available at major life thresholds. Mapping the journey from trauma to dynamic well-being, her work utilizes the expressive and social arts to establish body and heart as resources for authentic expression and diverse community connections. Rooted in rhythm and fueled by breath, this work inspires the sacred union between spirit, flesh, psyche, and deed. Melissa is the author of the book, Youth on Fire, Igniting a Generation of Embodied Global Leaders. It shares the story of her work with young people in principle and practice. These teachings will be available in September in an online course for people in all stages of life, moving through life's thresholds, pathways for embodied living and leading. Melissa has also directed and produced a number of films and performances, all of which share the stories of resilient people and communities, herself included. Melissa is a first-generation teacher of the five rhythms and a registered somatic educator and therapist with a doctorate degree in education, leadership, and change. She is dedicated to our collective renewal through the liberation of the creative spirit. Let's welcome Melissa to the show. Hi, Melissa. Welcome to the show. Hi, Leslie. Thank you so much. What a beautiful introduction. I'm honored and so happy to be here with you. Well, I'm excited to have you here. And, and I think we have a lot to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> In our preliminary chat here, we, uh, we found we have many, many areas of overlap. So um, let's just jump right in. So awesome. I like to... Um, always ask my guests just to tell us a little bit about where their dance journey began. How did you initially get involved with dance? 
Thank you, Leslie. Well, for like for so many of us, dance actually saved my life and eventually gave me a life. When I was a um, late teen, young adult, I was enraged. I was dealing drugs. I was extremely um, dysregulated in my eating. And I was um, moving fast and had no rudder. And by a many confluence of events, I found myself on a dance floor with Gabrielle Roth. And I sprained my ankle that first day. <laughs> and I had to go up to this epic teacher and say, what do I do? And you know, she said, dance on the floor. And then one, why don't you come to lunch with us? And I'm starting a teacher training. And, you know, it, it just all was my time and my path and the path for me. And I just began dancing. And I'd had a near death experience at the birth of my first daughter prior to that. And I'd had an epiphany um, in working with children overseas that somehow movement was our universal language, and I needed to learn how to speak it. And so I had this opportunity to study. And I was in enough pain inside of myself that I took it seriously. And I fell in love with what happened when I started moving and moving fast. And somehow that matched the intensity of my adrenalized nervous system, to be honest, and gave me a way to begin to sequence it through to states of peace. And so I was first generation teacher or student and remain student and teacher of the five rhythms, Gabrielle Roth body of work. And I, and I, and I just dove in and I danced, I danced through incredible um, grief and outrage. I danced into sublime connection with something bigger than myself that gave me a sense of hope, a sense of possibility. I danced and these channels started opening to this creative life force that actually was my inheritance. I come from a family of creative people, but because there had been so much um, angst and addiction and even violation, I had really been cut off from my life force, from that current. And the dance helped me begin to open to that. And most importantly, eventually, <laughs> I began to find some ground and some orientation on this earth, in this body, in relationship with the, with the natural world and the people around me. And it's been a very deep practice and study for what, you know, my entire adult life. So at this point, it's nearly 35 years or something. Um, since that fateful day in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, when I met the first of many really exquisite teachers to help me on my way. And dance was the doorway. So you were in your 30s when you first started dancing? Is that what I understood? No, I was in my 20s. I was in my okay. mid-20s. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And that you started with the five rhythms. I did. I did. I actually, that's not totally, totally true. I'd had a little bit of exposure to a few other things. A mime, incredible mime teacher, Samuel Avital, when I was still in college in, in, in Boulder. I mean, I could go back a step and just say I was what I, um, I was studying architecture and I realized that space has the capacity to heal us and transform us. And I got into the inquiry about what is sacred space and what are the principles that this, that, that help, uh, uh, inform the teachings. There you are near the pyramid that, that help inform the design of spaces that are healing. And that led me as a student exchange to South India, to uh, Oroville, to the Matra Mandir. And I went there to do architecture work, actually. And I got in the studio with all these brilliant young Indian women. And I felt so ignorant, actually. And I realized, first of all, who am I to be designing spaces for people I don't understand or know? And I didn't know. Um, I was so, my education was so barbaric in a certain way compared to the refinement of the women around me. And so I said, I'm going to step out of the studio and go meet these people. And I ended up in the village of Kotakarai um, and working with children. And that's really where the first epiphany came. I, I couldn't speak the language, of course of Tamil. 
And so I had to move my body to communicate. And as I say, you know, I started acting out in a whole different way. And I discovered that by moving my body, I could connect, I could build bridges, I could actually um, bring something through that had meaning. And also I felt better. And so that was really the first ding. And then um, I came back from India and I was hired to go back and work with children and take a group of youth over and got pregnant with my first child. And a number of things happened that caused me to say, wait, what is this body? And I'm so disassociated from it, dangerously so. And, um, and I want something different for my child than I had for myself in terms of um, safety, in terms of connection, in terms of really grounded, attuned um, relationship between uh, the mother and the child, which is where we first learn how to be in this body. And so I, you know, I put out a call, a sincere call, and that's soon thereafter I met Gabrielle. I think that we are, in the West, we are really disconnected from our bodies. I had the, the same experience, even though I had done dance since I was probably five or six years old, I, I never knew, I never experienced my body until I did the dance that I, the al dance alchemy that I did. And when that all came in, I just thought, wow, okay, now I understand why I have a body. <laughs> so yeah, I, I was probably, I was probably 40 by then. Um, yeah, so it, it was really such a, such a big thing to, to realize, oh, okay, now I finally, I understand why I have a body because I hadn't before that. And I think we are, we're so, you know, in the West, all those things about body image and um, I don't know, control and all of that. I think it really does just disconnect us from our body. And, and that's so unfortunate, but, um, and also your going to India, I think is quite profound because Carolyn Meese says one of the biggest spiritual lessons is to leave your tribe. And I think that that's true. When you leave your tribe, you start to realize that none of the rules apply, that all those things that you thought were just a given are not. They're a given in your own culture, but they're not sort of, you know, global or universal um, ideas. So I think that's always a very profound experience to allow yourself to step out of everything that you know. Yeah. Well, that's a big lead into the rites of passage work, but I just, I actually want to go back one step, Leslie, and just really speak to what you've touched and say this, because I don't think we can say it enough times. There are a lot of people making money off of us uh, being disconnected and, and even hating our bodies. And, um, you know, the need for us to medicate to regulate these extraordinarily intelligent emotions that long to be explored and expressed. The uh, message that we have to, you know, change the way our face is shaped and the wrinkles and the color and the this, that, and the other, the hair, everything. It's, it's a very serious business and many businesses, and we know that. And um, it's treacherous to uh, actually have reflections that let us, um, it's, it's treacherous to fall in love with what we truly are and to navigate through these potholes that are really designed to cause us to wanna go spend more money and dislike ourselves. And, and we've gone so far from what is healthy and whole. And I feel that those of us as oldering beings, women, who, however we identify, have a responsibility to say, hey, here are role models of people who have come to make peace with this incredible form that we have landed in in this lifetime and to discover the majesty of just that with the, the aches and the pains and the challenges and the wrinkles and the whole thing. And, um, and, this, and the sad thing is, it's not only do we spend so much time and money hurting ourselves and then having to heal ourselves, but we also lose connection with this life force that is so powerful and so creative and so intelligent and so critically needed. 
in order to help humanity navigate through these very, very difficult times. And if we're asleep or if we're not connected to our soul forces and the great energy that longs to move through us, we are not able to assist and we have to join our hands together right now. And so there goes that earphone. Um, can you still hear me? Yes. Okay, good. I'm going to try and put this back in. How's that? Yep, fine. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, we all need, we need each other and we need to, uh, it's an act of rebellion and it's an act of revolution. It's an act of sanity and dignity when we don't prescribe to um, what, uh, I can't think of the author's name, the beauty myth, when we don't prescribe to um, all these stories that there's something wrong with us, but rather we get to know what's actually our nature and the dance. And being in a, a community that can offer us reflections, both those together really give us a space to befriend uh, the vulnerability and the intelligence of who we are. And from that, our gifts can be cultivated. So um, it's in some ways after this time of all of us being in front of these Zoom screens, in some ways it's worse than ever, even after all the work that we've done. And at the same time, there is so much, speaking of that work, that's happened to awaken people's um, curiosity and knowledge about somatic intelligence. So we're really at the cusp of um, some possibility that the things that you and I bushwhacked, and we were, of course, endowed with some great teachers, um, those things will become more mainstream and are. And, and so that's the bad news and the good news. Um, and, it's always you know, a double-edged sword. <laughs> yeah. I think there could be a lot of, I, I think the this particular, you know, lockdown and all of that um, was an opportunity for us to go inside, to stop focusing everything on the outside world and to look at our interior space, our inner landscapes and to communicate with ourselves which a lot of people spend a lot of time and a lot of money in order to never have to do that. So I totally. do think it created that opportunity. And I think you made a good point also about community in the sense that if you want to step out of anything, you need that community to support you because it's very difficult if you have a different idea. Like if you decide that, um, I don't want to buy into this concept of, of somebody else telling me what's beautiful. You somehow need support because that's, you're going to be bombarded from all sides of everyone telling you that you're wrong just because that's the cultural norm. So I think community becomes really important when you're trying to find or experience these other these other places or these other ideas. And, uh, and unfortunately in the West, as you mentioned, I think control is such an issue at that very masculine power over thing that uh, we wanna control our bodies and what we think and everybody around us. And I, instead of that allowing that embracing my body, whatever my body is, and just allowing it to be and finding the wonder in that, no, I need control. I need, I need to make it what I want it to be. And, um, and control always comes from fear. So I suppose that it's, it's based in that, but, um, yeah, there's, <laughs> It's not easy. <laughs> well, I think exactly. we really do need community. Yeah. We all want to belong. And, and if everything out there is telling us you, you are to behave and look this way in order to belong, um, we're going to work really hard to try and make that happen. And yeah. of course, that's not what real community is built on. Um, the name of that author, of course, is Naomi Wolf, The Beauty Myth, just to complete that loop. Um, I wonder if we should talk about um, community and rites of passage and what Caroline Miss says about yeah. leaving one's tribe. But can you tell us maybe before we get into that, just to, to complete our sort of building a base, you started these, 
You're the founder of three organizations. And I'm wondering if you can tell us about what they are, the uh, Soma Source and the Golden Girls Global and the Golden Bridge. Are these all parts of the same thing or are they, did they one come out of the other or what are they and, and uh, how do they fit together or not fit together? Great question, thank you so much. So Golden Bridge is the umbrella organization, our not-for-profit, through which the experiment, we call it the experiment that we know as Golden Bridge, um, gave us the space to cultivate many things, including this rites of passage process that um, we know happens in our youth camps, surfing the creative, but eventually grew into a training and a body of work that we call Soma Source. So Golden Bridge hosts all of our programs, Movement Mass and our trilogy gender work and, um, and the training, the Soma Source leadership training. And everybody who's in that process with me and our team starts with the rites of passage journey and begins to do their inner work. And from that, eventually move into, if they choose, it is, it is chosen to the to move into more of a leadership training process, Soma Source. Golden Girls Global is one of the branches that have grown out of the leaders who have come of age to this work and are now out in their communities bringing this work into their spaces um, in innovative, culturally sensitive, um, developmentally appropriate ways. The truth is I began my work as a teenager, to be honest, working with younger girls. And I've always worked, um, I've always had a space where I'm working with, with girls or people, sometimes girls are questioning, but a space for the feminine. That's always been a part of what I have done along with working across all genders and life cycles. Um, and so that's a lot of the work actually grew out of what we understood was needed in that adolescent developmental process and eventually not just for girls, but for all genders. So Golden Girls Global is um, really what grew out of people coming of age and stepping into maturity and leadership and then forming a collaborative entity of young female identified leaders that are rooted in every place from Ogallala Lakota Sioux in the US, Baltimore, South India, the Middle East, across the Middle East, uh, Brazil, Colombia, uh, South Africa, Uganda, DRC, etc. And um, and it's a beautiful, intimate group of people who have worked very hard together, who have st struggled and seen each other go through hell and transform, and are now really tending to together thousands of girls around the world. So that's that. And Golden Bridge still remains the mothership, training people and offering a number of different programs out into the world. So I hope that begins to answer that question. <laughs> You've put them all the, all the pieces in place. Now we can, we can go on. So let's talk about what this initiatory process, these rites of passage, what, what do you mean by that? Thank you, Leslie. So um, looking at my own biography and then noticing who was being sent to me as I began my my work out in the world, bringing movement into the community. I started off working with uh, children and then I worked with pregnant women and postpartum families. So I, was, I was learning how to use the tools, the somatic tools that I was, was healing my life with. I was learning how to bring them out into community. But everything started to go ding when parents started to say, hey, would you do this for our teenagers? And, um, a young person who, whose mother knew me, who was dropping out of school, her mother said, hey, can you take her? And um, I said, sure. And we developed curriculum for, for this young person and then two other people. And we began to design a process that helped them navigate through uh, their adolescent journey from in ideal circumstances, the safe shores of their childhood into, uh, productive young adulthood. And it paralleled uh, a developmental process that I had been studying deeply, informed by both Gabrielle Roth's work and Rudolf Steiner's work, and that being the first developmental task of getting in the body. 
and then that of befriending one's emotional landscape, and then that of really awakening up the intelligence that happens when the body and the heart and the thinking start to come into congruency, the soul starts to awaken. So I designed a process that was a marriage of these uh, bodies of work along with my deep understanding from my own personal experience of how to unwind trauma and how to use the expressive arts and other tactile arts to help individuals come into their bodies, find their ground, learn how to track sensation, learn how to re-regulate in the face of what we might understand as shock and trauma, too much, too soon, too fast. So to help people really start to find where their ground is and then how to mobilize through these beautiful rhythms, expand their palette of expression. These rhythms articulated by Gabrielle Ross find their flow. Some people are really comfortable in that. Some people are stuck in that. Others are constantly in their staccato and don't know how to actually just drop it and be. And there's a whole art to all of that. And when we have that base in that flowing and that staccato, we can move into that chaos, that surrender. And many people are stuck there and others are scared of going there, but it's part of the beauty of our bodies capacity to express themselves and re-regulate and sequence energy all the way through to eventually there's that spaciousness, that lyrical, that expansion, that deep inhale and that opening and that way of being more present so we can move into true stillness. And these are mainly teenagers? So I'm going to, I'm going to get us there. It's just, it, just taking a moment in that stillness with you. Yeah, so mainly teenagers. Well, that's where the work began, but helping teenagers oh gosh, um, move through, come into their bodies, befriend their emotions, their fear, their anger, their grief, their joy, uh, and their capacity to love themselves and one another. And then through different developmental stages so they can start moving out of reaction, befriend their biographies so they can start to hear what is their true destiny. And we lead them through a very specific process. That's those seven cycles that then uh, shape the Soma source work. And in that, we really realized it's a rite of passage. It's a contemporary rite of passage. And as you so beautifully said in your opening, it's ancient and relevant to right now, contemporary. What's ancient is this model of a rite of passage where you, as Van Gennep says, you leave the familiar, as you said, Caroline Myth. We have to leave the safe shores of what we know and step into the turbulent, transformative, unknown waters of change. And that's where community is critical. That's where support is essential to help people find how do we navigate this uncharted waters and all of humanity. So this is where it's relevant. It's not just for youth. It's not just for um, teenagers, although that's a natural developmental time, but we're all in one right now where we cannot go back and we don't know what the future is going to look like. And we need to use these resources to help us find our rudder to navigate through horrific environmental disaster and change, social reckoning, And of course, this pandemic, economic instability, so much that leaves us going, whoa, who, where am I? Who am I? Who are my people? And how will we go forward? And so in the rites of passage, we, we, we hold each other. We use these tools and dance is such an integral part of it because it helps us unwind the charge, befriend the wounds, find the soul forces and open to this incredible spiritual energy that's actually longing to help us through so that we can hook up with our creativity and chart a new path forward, which is what we're all being asked to do. And we've seen so much innovation in this time. Of course, we've also seen uh, so much destruction. And it's the same with any rites of passage and certainly adolescence. There's always the presence of death 
are we going to make it through? And we have to tether ourselves to life and keep orienting in that direction. And, and, um, and for us olders and our elders is somehow keep an eye on that light, that possibility um, that we can find our way through, that there is a possibility of something new, of renewal. And that's where we are as a humanity and that's where teenagers are. And they need us in community, the many generations to come and hold it steady so they can get lost and get found, long and short. Um, that's the rite of passage because when you come through the threshold, that incredible time of instability and possibility, there's something called incorporation and integration. And for those of us here in the U.S. who've had the blessing, or not just the U.S., but in the West, uh, of really safe time out of time and have had the opportunity for those who choose to have these shots, we are in a process of incorporation. How are we going to emerge? What's that going to look like? What's, what's, what is required of us now? And the dance is just this place to come in and pray and listen and get our guidance. Thank you. So do you work, I think, Personally, I think rites of passage are something that's so important and obviously things that still happen in more indigenous cultures. Um, even in cultures like Egypt, it's, it's something that still happens. But I think in the West, growing up there, I spent most of my um, school years there, there's this feeling that you always need to be an adult. At least that's what I felt as a child, that I always needed to be an adult. And I think this concept of having a rite of passage kind of allows you to, to get that feeling of moving through different stages of your life, that you're a child. And then, yes, as you grow up, you reach this point where you're becoming an adult, an adolescent, and then an adult. And that someone should acknowledge that, that there, this is a transition. It's also a very difficult pe period of time for, for most people. But I think just that not having any kind of lines, not to put people in boxes, but just that there doesn't seem to be any clear timeline about what's to be expected. Um, I think that leaves a person just kind of floating a little bit. I think we need this you know, um, and I think that it, it, it's more obvious for, for a female because she gets her period. So there is something that's very physical about an experience. But other than that, everything just seems to be really vague. So I think that that is something that, that even if you do it within your own group or family, to just consider bringing these things back into the, and the same thing as we get older, when women go through menopause, you know, this could be another celebration, but to really celebrate these passages. But I, what I wanted to get an idea about is, so are you working with different groups of people, like based on their age? Are you working with, say, adolescents, this rites of passage, or you're doing the same thing with different age groups? Great question. Um, can I go back one step and just speak about um, robbing our children around the world of their, of their childhoods and uh, what a serious matter that is? Um, yeah, I just want to say it's, it's, first of all, it's not just in the Western world, although it's extreme, especially now with all this internet. We have nine year olds like learning how to have sex. Uh, on a screen in a, in a completely heartless, disconnected way and, um, and younger <laughs> and thinking, you know, that they know something, which of course it's not even, they're not even developmentally ready to contemplate much less witness and all of that. But also in so many places around the world, the children are raising the younger siblings. The children are um, having to do the work of parenting the, they're in, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're siblings and um, losing 
the opportunity to have a protected, well-nourished um, childhood experience. And that's really around the world, just in very different ways. And our children are just being abducted. Uh, and I have an elder, Elder Paul Hill, who always says, um, what's happening with the children is what's happening with the whole culture. So we can look to the children to see how we're doing and how are the children, he says. So by the time we get to adolescence, if we haven't had a childhood, there's a lot of repair that needs to happen. So back to your question, Leslie, if we're working with adults, if we're working with teenagers, um, everybody gets, everybody has a need to go and do some developmental repair work. and. Um, we don't necessarily have to call it that, we embed it in the experience. And um, it's often um, very tender to all of a sudden see just some glorious, strong male being just break down and realize that, you know, he's always been taking care of his mother who lived in poverty or had a, an addiction and that he never got to be held and he gets to be held in the space. And that's just what's needed in order for his incredible intelligence to start to come online. And he doesn't need to keep smoking weed to stay connected to the mother because he's had this developmental arrestation. I'm just making up a story, but it's not far from the kinds of things we see. And the, and the truth is, um, and I've we've had this for years, that of course the young people at that pregnant moment of adolescence that journey of coming through puberty into young adulthood, uh, a rite of passage where they are taught, like you're saying, what the culture around them expects from them as adults. And they are given an opportunity to see that there's something bigger and to find their muscle, their healthy will to navigate their way through difficulty. That's a beautiful thing to offer adolescents, but so many of us didn't have that. So we, we, in our work, we do work with the youth, but we also have an intergenerational rite of passage experience that allows people of all ages and stages to come and do the same body of work because we're always picking up loose threads and we're always um, awakening into ever more somatic consciousness within these bodies. And, and that supports our soul coming into even more vibrancy in, in its true colors. So yes, we work with youth and we work with adults and we work cross-culturally. And that's, a, that's actually, in, in my understanding, one of the great thresholds of these times is how can we bear witness to one another? How can we learn about one another? How can we actually take responsibilities for the impacts that our people have had on one another? And to do so, as you know, on the dance floor is risky. <laughs> But more importantly, it's um, exquisite because we realize we all have a struggle and we all have grief and we all need ceremony. And to, to do that together allows us to begin to breathe together and to fall in love. And once we have that base, for the most part, we can do the very hard work of, of peace and reconciliation. And we, and we do it in our own small little you know, we work with however many people we work with. It's not the world, but it's seeds that go out into the world. And we hope that those seeds create um, beautiful gardens that nourish communities and, and, and breeds hope. And um, that's just what my soul's call has been uh, in this lifetime. And um, it's messy and it's um, in some ways in a, it's an experiment that's ever evolving and We've had a lot of success and we've had some real, real stumbles along the way, but we do keep dancing. And what kind of dance are you doing? Are you using mainly like the five rhythms or are, is there something specific to this process or how are you using dance? Great, great question. Build community? Yeah. Well, we are using the five rhythms. That's a very significant practice at the root of all of our work. And then because we are so culturally endowed, I am having everybody study, um, you know, ancient Chinese dance and East Indian dance and hip hop and 
um, different forms of African dance and Brazilian uh, dance, different forms of, of Brazilian dance, and um, but really culturally rich uh, uh, forms that actually are taught by people who have been raised uh, in those lineages and bring that to the conversation. And then we take them and we put them through the five rhythms and we, we mix and match and do all kinds of, of really, um, I think, exciting performance that part of coming out of the rite of passage experience, we actually get on stage together and tell our collective story through dance and through um, poetry and such and, and sign, sign, American sign language has been also one of the forms. So we, we want to expand everybody's palette while also deeply respecting the original uh, teachings that come through the leaders who come onto our dance floors. And the rhythms is a practice that's woven throughout and into, infused into everybody's bodies and, um, and emotional landscape. And what about your personal? I want to get into this. <laughs> I'm segueing into this because I think this is really important. But your personal experiences with dance or, or dancing through, through thresholds, I think you have an important story to tell here. Thank you, Leslie. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I, Gabrielle Ross said many years ago, um, what did she say? If you, if you want to dance like me, then dance like you. And I really, um, I'm, I'm not a happy person when I don't get to do my own dance and be on the front lines of my own becoming. And life has given me many opportunities to uh, practice and, and live these teachings, starting with um, catching a beloved partner who drowned in the ocean and having to navigate my way back from shock in a very public setting, not starting with, but including in a very public way, because our whole community was deeply in love with Steve Cannon and his death was a major initiation for me and for all of us. How do you come through shock in, and, and allow community and the dance to help us return and make sense out of an extraordinarily mind-blowing, tragic um, loss? And, um, that was followed um, by many, many, many young people having their own experiences of, of extreme challenge and having to walk with them through that and stay with them. And my body is my attunement, my instrument of attunement. So I have um, learned how to be with extreme challenge in the body and stay connected and help the energy sequence through. And in my mid fifties, I'm now just about to turn 60. I had a good at the door from ovarian, late stage ovarian cancer. And just when I thought like, I was really about to write the book on threshold dancing, to be honest, that's the title of the book. Um, and then this came along and it was like, oh, still more to learn. And I have to honestly say, Leslie, had I not spent a lifetime of practice about how to stay present in the face of great struggle, great sensations of, of pain, um, I would not have been able to stay as present through this as I did. And um, it's sort of my, it's my way to um, lean in rather than look for shortcuts or, or ways out. And I found that by leaning in and staying really awake in the face of it all, it's actually a shortcut. So I was able to go through the shocking news to surgery three days later to um, very extreme chemotherapy, both intraperitoneal and IV, um, all within a condensed period of, of five months. And um, you know, use as few drugs as humanly possible and just keep dancing through it and, and writing through it and, and sitting in the most extraordinarily searing pain. But uh, Peter Levine's work has also shaped my thinking and my practice and learning how to just be with sensation and track it and allow it to sequence through allowed me to come through this in a way that is um, a story worth telling. And so as I came out of chemotherapy and my doctors both, I mean, they thought I was a little, whoa, this woman is unlike 
many others, I would say like, no, don't give me a blood infusion. Give me two days. I got to go home and make art about this and dance about this and pray on this. And, you know, imagine healthy, happy dancing platelets. And they would go with me after a while. At first, they weren't so curious about me. And then they came to understand that I really believed in this. And I followed this. And I trusted my body. And I trusted the medicine and the alchemy of the integrative approaches. I got to have a drink of something here. Hang on. (laughs) So as part of my integration, I made a film because there was some way of, I needed to come back. I was done with treatment. I had, I had more than survived and I was new. And that new me, you know, I used to have long hair and all that, um, wanted to express herself. And so I had the blessing of working with a really beautiful young filmmaker, Hannah Taylor. And, and we went into the, a black box for one hour and I just told my story and she put a light on me. And we filmed it and, um, and then we added in a few pieces outside another day and we made this 11 minute film called Twisted Gift. And I'd love for y'all to see it because um, it, it really shares a story of the vulnerability and the power of dancing through life's thresholds. And um, I don't wish the journey I made on anyone. And I also hope that it can inspire those who have been asked to make that journey to do so um, in the spirit of, of staying connected to what's happening versus doing what, just as we started this talk, what the pharmaceuticals would like us to do, which is actually check out so that they can fix us. And that's just not, that's not my way. Can you define what you mean by thresholds? Cause I think this is, sure. this is important. And I think it might be something that might be confusing to people. Thank you, Leslie. So change heralds, call, change calls. And we are asked to leave the shores of the familiar. Van Gennep talks about that as the stage of, called severance in his seminal book called Rite of Passage. And then we go through something called a threshold experience. It can happen through a life crisis like a flood or a fire or a pandemic or a cancer diagnosis or a divorce or any number of things, a sudden death, or it can be a healthy, normal developmental process like adolescence, giving birth, even death itself. But where we have left the familiar and we are not yet in the new place, we go through a threshold experience where we lose our bearings. We don't, we can't go back and we don't know what that new shore, we can't stand on it. We don't know what it's going to look like or who we're going to be once we get there. And we have to navigate those waters and often very treacherous, unstable waters of change. And so that is a threshold experience where um, we are in a liminal state. And often it can be, have a really deep uh, descent. And often it can also have the possibility of opening to something so vast and so big. And I think many of us know that at those most horrific moments in our lives, when we feel pretty ripped, open, ending of a relationship, there's also this sense of sort of, it's awful. And it's also awesome. Something is opening. We might remember our how to pray like never before. We might see, you know, see, see the universe from a cosmic perspective, uh, we open to what that universal dance that connects us with all of life. And so in that threshold, like you said, you know, there's so much, there's, there's challenge and there's opportunity. And in this pandemic, for example, we've certainly seen both at work. And that's been a really rigorous threshold experience that we are finding our way or beginning to find our way out of many people, not all. We know that people are still in parts of the world going into the next lockdown. And to help ourselves come out of it is an art. And I feel that that's our work now as practitioners is to create safe spaces, safer spaces where people can use these somatic tools of ah, 
tracking sensation, even coming into our senses if there's a lot of shock. So and mobilizing, moving to sequence the energy through and find new ground. So it's a doorway to transformation. It's a doorway that, I mean, the threshold is a kind of a doorway to move into a transformation. It is a potential transformation. Yeah, it is a transformational experience, but one can get lost there if there isn't a rudder. One can go. Well, that was my that was my question. <laughs> was what if what if somebody chooses not to go through that doorway? Like if if you come to that threshold and you choose not to go through it, which I think sometimes people do, they just sort of check out. Well, I, I think I agree with you that it's an opportunity for for complete change. But I'm just curious as to whether you encounter people who come to this threshold and say, "No, I'm not going through." You bet I do, Leslie. And and I think it's it's sometimes a conscious choice because it's too scary, or they don't really believe that they can get through. Sometimes there's addiction, which has it has a mind of its own and can convince people that this is more fun than that. Uh, they, especially when the will gets broken through you know, habits that don't help us know we can make our way through. So sometimes it's a semi-conscious choice, but often it's, it's a lack of knowledge of how to get through. And that's where we as midwives have to show up and help each other navigate our way through. Most young people in our journeys come to a point in the process where they're like, I can't do this. I, I'm not going to do this. I don't know how to do this. And our job as those who actually trust the process and have tools that we respect and, and as a community can hold that shaking of I can't do this. That's where we come in and have a responsibility to hold, hold the hand or give the push or stand right there and say, you got this. And to keep doing that so that people can find their way through. Because I think basically people do want to find their way through. And sadly, many, many, many get stuck somewhere along the way, whether it's a developmental arrestation and addiction, or literally, um, you know, they've been medicated and they've lost their, 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 self, their sense of individuated self, or it's never even been cultivated. And that could be a developmental wound, or there's just um, not enough support. And, um, and, and then there's evil, to be honest. And I don't, I'm not going to get into a whole thing around that. But I truly believe that, that maybe some people are, are really not interested in getting through and are, are something has grabbed hold of them. And they are committed to, to bringing themselves and perhaps even others down. Um, and I think we're in a time on the planet when there are people who don't want us to go through that door, like you said, yeah. and for any number of reasons. But my job is to stand with anybody who gives me a true indication that they want this, to like keep that light on and, um, and, and, and be pretty unwavering. And that sometimes means going away for a few years but I always got them on my screen. <laughs> and that's a blessed curse as a leader, to be honest. I'm very and mindful think, of, go ahead, please. No, finish, finish your thought, because I'm gonna <laughs> go somewhere else. <laughs> I'm mindful of what I take on at this point, because it is, it is a, it's a burden to, to help souls navigate through. And, and as after having gone through cancer and now COVID, menopause and all of it I uh, I just I I have to my job now is more to train people to be on those front lines and to always be on them to always be that first phone call which I was for decades and I think this is where storytelling is important because we need to hear the stories of success you need to tell your story whether it's in a movie or a dance or whatever or just telling the story of these stories of success because people need to realize 
I think that helps people build their courage as to wanting to step through these thresholds is that, yes, I can do this. Look, she did that. I can do this as well. So I think that storytelling is also an important part of this, this whole process. And that is something that's the gift you can give. And also going back to that concept of a circle of elders, this is what the elders do. They hold that space. They tell the stories. They don't have to do all the work. You have to do your own work in the end. But I think to get to that point where I'm there to tell the stories of the things that have come before, possibly my own experiences, but that that's the gift or that's how we can support other people. It doesn't have to be necessarily, you know, even holding their hand through the whole process, but to give them that 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 idea, to plant that seed that that this is a possibility and I did it and I survived it and this is where I'm standing at this point in time. Leslie, that's what you do. You create spaces for people to share their stories and you do it with so much warmth and grace and to open up space for other humans to come and share their stories is a, is a really beautiful act of devotion. And I'm so honored to have been included in your list of people to um, um, speak into this gorgeous space you've created. And I just want to thank you because that's real what you said. And there's wisdom there for me. So I'm, I'm receiving you <laughs> like that's <laughs> enough too. thank you. Yeah. It really is yeah. a big teaching for me. Thank you. And cancer, the, uh, I'm a homeopath as well, but the, the psychology behind cancer is when we allow others to consume us. So I think that that can be the lesson of cancer is that I don't sacrifice myself for everyone else or for someone else. And the way to do that, and again, that's not useful. Like they tell you in the airplane, put your own oxygen mask on first. Again, we're not, we're not trained that way. At least I wasn't brought up that way. My programming is not that. My programming is to always think about everybody else first. But if you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of anybody else. And I think you realize this, especially when you become a parent. But that should also come into our healing circles, that I cannot be consumed. at the. Otherwise, I'm lost. So I can offer something. I can offer a story. I can offer a space. And that's the concept of holding space also, is not to fix other people's problems but just to create a space for other people to fix themselves. And I do think storytelling is an important part of that, to give these examples um, of things that have happened that, that have been successful in, the, um, in their process. Well, you've definitely nailed me, so thank you. <laughs> I, as a little girl, when I went to summer camp, the, the camp counselors would say to my parents, like, she needs to, uh, uh, if Melissa can take care of herself, she'll be okay in this life. So it's definitely been a life teaching for me. And I, and I do take really good care of myself at this point and have to. Um, but there's something that I think I grew up with and many of us have grown up with, which is this whole concept of never enough. We are not enough. We're not doing enough. It's not enough. And um, it's often associated with whiteness. And um, as a little girl whose father was raised in Mexico, raised, born in Russia and raised in Mexico, I used to spend a lot of time on the banks of the Rio Grande, moving back and forth between Piedras Negras and Eagle Pass. And I would see the um, Kickapoo children living in cardboard boxes. And that stirred my soul so deeply at such a young age. And I was just like, I am going to do everything I can because this is not okay. That this is happening. And so um, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a call, it's a, it's, a, it's a requirement of a soul. And then to find that balance, I think, is a, is a life practice. And there is no doubt that my teaching, one of the many during the cancer journey, was uh, to, to remember myself and the importance of my own beloved dance and, 
and my joy in that and and to step back so others can step forward and to get out of the way so that together we could create a new way and and that's the process we're in right now and um i really appreciate you reminding me that that that's a huge part of what now is and the future is and um i think this is a gift for me as i'm coming out of this pandemic time that the storytelling is is critical so i just want to honor you as my um wise friend and and teacher right here right now thank you leslie just to remind you <laughs> of what you already know yeah but i think that a lot of people are not choosing to go that this is why i brought this up about the threshold and and choosing to go through it i think with this pandemic a lot of people are not choosing to go through it they're they're trying to backpedal i mean so many people are talking about wanting to get back to their life you know this life that they had before and was it so wonderful i mean maybe it was for some people but um that i feel that that's a big thing that's coming up and maybe we those people who who did benefit from the pandemic i mean personally in their own journey maybe we need to tell our stories of how we benefited and what we got out of it because i don't think it was a bad experience i mean that's not to minimize the people that died and things like that but i think a lot came out of this and and Maybe we need to tell those stories as well of, of what we gained from it as much as what we lost. I couldn't agree more, Leslie. And I said when this first thing happened, when this first happened, it was like a spirit said, all right, everybody go to your room, time out. You know, it's like, <laughs> you have been poorly behaving. So yes, there, was, there has been an incredible opportunity. And many of us who are basically introverts realize how much we love this. And yep. I just want to, really, really acknowledge that I have students, beloved community members around this world where they're living too many people in a house or there's children living with people who are uh, violent in their homes and they have no reprieve or people who don't have food literally. And that there's so much extreme circumstances happening during this pandemic. And there's uh, not the opportunity to do this kind of um, uh, looks within that you're speaking about. Mm -hmm. And with that, there's been incredible innovation that's happened during this time and, and um, retrofit. I don't know if that's the right word, but uh, there's been a lot of remaking of self and, and renewal and, and that's a blessing. And like you said, um, you know, we're either resisting life or going with it. And that's what the dance I think teaches us is to move with, the muse, the music, the current, the spirit, what's stirring in our souls and to make a dance out of it because it all is a dance. And I know that's cliche, but it's actually really not. And I think those of us that have movement as our base practice have the capacity to keep moving with what life offers us, you know, the hell realms and the blessings and to um, find a way to make good of it all. And I think that's what you're speaking to. And, and as dancers, um, we, are, we are so endowed to be uh, role models for that and to catalyze that in others. And that's um, a shared devotion we have. And um, the dance must go on. And we're even getting offline. We're going to come into person soon. And I'm very excited about that. Following on from that, if I, if I could ask you this question to just, can you tell us what, through this journey, this threshold that you went through, what did you experience in dance? What was it about the dance that you were doing? And were you doing some specific kind of dance? But, but what did it bring you? Did it was it was it the grounding was it the joy what what did you get out of it or how did you use it as as a way to get through this particular journey and you're talking about the pandemic no i'm talking more about your the 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 journey with cancer 
for you personally? Yeah. Um, what? A, a, thank you. I love that question. I remember when I came home from surgery. Well, first of all, in the hospital, <laughs> I got up. I was hooked up to machines, and my youngest daughter, Robin, got out her little video camera. I didn't know she was doing that, and I was like, "Do the boogie woogie." And I, I like had stitches, and I just remember going, "Ah!" But I just this sense of humor. <laughs> it's like nothing will stop me from dancing, and and so there was something about after this like amazing liberation that happened in getting this chunk of disease out of my body to realize, yep, the dance is still there. And it helped me actually feel my feet because I had, I'd had, I'd been cut in my womb space. So that was one. And then I came home from the hospital and this was like the most sacred moment almost of my life. I just um, put on a piece of music that one of my dear friends had sent me and I, I, someone had dropped off some food, I asked them to come back and, and I videoed it. And I just, I just danced really slow and deep. And, you know, I had to take care of these stitches, but I was about five days out of sur surgery. And I just had, I wept. It was just like, oh my gosh, I'm alive. And this dance, I can still dance. And there's this memory of being so connected to that world and rooted in this world and alive right here. And it was just such a coming home. I mean, the dance is a place of coming home to me. So it, it gave me a sense of, of hope at that moment, a sense of like, it's going to be okay. You know, I'm still dancing. And what it also did, because we use social media it let everybody around the world that who I love and who love me, like my peeps, know that, hey, she's alive. This is going to, something's going on that's okay over there because people were wondering, they were concerned. And then I, um, you know, I danced all the time whenever I could. Um, I would, when I was get, going, coming after the chemotherapy, it was a lot of getting my life force back online. And it was small dances, it was contained dances. It was, um, I was, I had to process the, the way my body had changed. And I also had to process that I was gonna, I was actually gonna put chemotherapy into my body. And I'd been kind of the organic Melissa. I hadn't put anything much like that in my body. And I just had to make sense of it all. So it was my place, my inner laboratory of therapy and self-exploration and, and um, I was often working with these five rhythms. Um, but then when I started with the chemotherapy, it had a whole different purpose. One, I really don't like, um, what are those things called? Steroids. I really don't like them. And I did have to take them. And so it would be a way for me to sort of discharge some of that extra energy. I would literally, uh, before the chemo treatments, I would have to take a steroid at night and then in the morning. And I always... In my case, it was appropriate. I took a lesser dose than they told me to. And that morning, I would run up a mountain by my house, and I would just get up there, and I would shake, and I would, ah, I was just like, I was like so jittery, and I just would like discharge this intense energy. And then I would go do the infusion and go through this whole thing, and I would still have another day before I would tank, before I would crash, and I would, I would move a lot and just help move this very chemical energy uh, that was very nervy through my body. And then I would, and then I would go into deep, deep, deep stillness, like a wild animal that had been um, shot in a certain way. I would, it would almost like I would play dead so that my body could alchemize. It was also very tired, the, the chemo and, 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 you know, I would just eat the minimum that I, that I could eat. I wanted to eat more, but my body wasn't able to do it. And then the minute I had enough energy to get up, I would. It, it, it was a discipline. And I would take myself outside and into nature. I would often, actually, right after the chemo, I would go flat onto the earth on my belly. And I speak about this in the film and just discharge, let the earth help me out. I would let it regulate me. Uh, uh, with the nourishment and the life force of the earth. And, and then, you know, each cycle, I would have these three week cycles where I would get these infusions and then there'd be the second infusion the next week. And then I'd have a week where I was semi normal. That's like an exaggeration, but um, I had, I wasn't sort of tripping in my mind and body and I would 
do a lot of just trying to find my end point and come back to my belly and my pelvic floor and the soles of my feet. And in particular, my brain, you know, chemotherapy messes with your endpoints. I had a lot of neuropathy and my brain was, you know, they call it chemo brain. It was really strange. And so I would, I would do a lot of, you know, moving from deep, deep stillness and tracking of sensation to then really, uh, you know, just like a lot of, I don't want to do it because these earbuds are going to fall out, but um, just a lot of really movement. And then I would just, you know, I felt like, you know, I'm beautiful. I'm whole. This is okay. I'm good. I got this. And I would breathe and dance. And, and honestly, I just felt like it was, I was being rotor rooted <laughs> and, um, and I did not let it, like, I knew that there's a toxicity and a poison to that chemo, but I just was taking it in as like liquid gold that my body was going to work with. And, um, and, and I stayed, I just stayed with my body and all the sensations. And sometimes it was so extreme. And I worked with a homeopath uh, because there was a point in each, each treatment where it was, because it was interperineal chemo, it was like razor blades in my belly. It was so bad. And I would take, I think it was Staphylococcus and things would calm down. So, you know, it was like, it was all a dance, but I definitely was committed to being in nature and moving my body and finding really integrative stillness and 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 the stillness that i cultivated in my being has been a, a natural progression in the maturing of a soul in life but not so easily accessible to me um and now it's just really part of my palette and my repertoire and and i learned that through this that's beautiful Thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you for asking, Leslie. If people want to see this film, can they can they access it somehow? It's called Absolutely. Twisted Gift. Twisted Gift. It's on YouTube. It's on Golden Bridge and Melissa Michaels' YouTube channel. And it's okay. also on the home homepage of our website, goldenbridge.org. Okay. I will I will give I will put all those links in the show notes. Uh, maybe you can tell us about anything that's up and coming. Thank you for talking to us. I, I don't want to keep you here forever. So I, <laughs> I think we can have a whole nother conversation at some other point in time. But um, just to wrap up, let us know what you're doing. Do you have up and coming events? Leslie, thank you. I, I really just want to honor you and, and just the generosity in what you're doing and the graciousness. That's the word I've used twice now and how you meet, you have met me and welcomed me and, and um, taken this time to share my gifts. And I look forward to learning more about you because I know that you're carrying a wealth of intelligence and, and grace again um, and beauty into this world. And you're doing so from a perspective that is unique and important. So thank you. Thank and you. yeah, um, I wanna say that if you get on our website, for one, you'll see what many of the leaders are doing in our community around the world, communities. And a lot of them are working with children. And Leslie, you and I spoke about our children and, and the dance of parenting. And I just really wanna encourage all of our listeners to just put the music on at home <laughs> get those children moving when you're waiting for the carpool or when you're cooking dinner or when you're frustrated with each other or don't put the music on just make it all a dance and there's something about um that's what i'm doing I'm, i have a 97 year old dad that i'm taking care of and you know we do a little whatever we can and um i just i feel the importance of it really getting out of the extraordinary and coming into the ordinary and um, what I am doing that's available to the public, you all right now is literally in an hour and 45 minutes online. We'll have our last movement mass, which is a one hour uh, led dance by me. Um, you can find it on goldenbridge.org. 
this morning. This morning, I'm here on the East Coast of the United States. And um, so we have our weekly movement mass. We'll, we'll, we'll do one a month online. The next one will be September 12th. And the other ones in between will be in person in Boulder, Colorado. I do have a really seminal online course that we were hoping to launch in September. It looks like it'll launch a little bit later, but you can get on our mailing list or send an email to our office at goldenbridge.org and get on that list. We'll, we'll have a big ebook that comes out that shares these seven cycles of our rites of passage process. And then we'll be taking people through a very deep journey, a global community around the world. And I'm super excited about that 26 films and put a lot of energy into that. And then, um, you know, we have in-person work that we do and um, there'll be other things emerging so you can hop on our mailing list. And for Golden Girls Global, we'll have events too. So check that out and we're happy to keep you posted. Um, we'll, have, we'll have a number of online events this fall. Details to come. And Bottom if people line. want to find you on Facebook, your on Facebook is Melissa Michaels. Instagram, Melissa Michaels Movement. So you can check out her her website, which is again goldenbridge.org and goldengirls.org. And Golden. And you have also, I think you have those same things on Instagram as well, right? There's a there's a Golden Bridge on Instagram. And a awesome. Golden Girls Global. Yep, and a Golden Girls Global. Okay. And on our YouTube channel, there's so many videos, me teaching at the UN and the young people doing their performances and really exquisite films, incredible films about the work with the girls around the world. So if you, if you want to learn more, it's lots of films too. Excellent. Thank you. Well, thank you for being here and thank you for all the work that you're doing because this is really, this is important and, and it sounds wonderful. I didn't know much about you before today, but <laughs> I'm very excited wow. about what I've learned and I hope that our audience is as well because yes, and your book, Youth on Fire, which I think you can get uh, through your website or it's on Amazon, right? And it's really relevant to all ages and stages. Yeah, it's on Amazon. Thank you. Okay. Just, we forgot to mention that. Thank yes. you, Well, Leslie. there's a lot of things that we never got to. So <laughs> as I said, we need another conversation. But all right. Well, thank you for being here. I really, I really appreciate your work and, and you spending time with us and telling us your story and, and what you're doing. And I hope that people who are watching will contact you and get involved with that. All right, thank you for being here. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you for having me, Leslie, thank you. Bye-bye. All right. That was very illuminating. I'm excited to, to go and watch those videos. So I'll, I'll have to check those out and I hope you will as well. Let me just, take you to what's happening next month. So next month, my, my guest will be Tony Bergens. She's the creatrix of Journey Dance, and that will be on August 22nd. And again, if you are watching on YouTube, please subscribe, like, that helps us get some more um, get in those algorithms so that other people can find us as well. And if you're listening to this as a podcast, the same thing, if you can just like and share. If you enjoyed this and you know people who would be interested, please share with them. All right, so until next month, I wish you all the best, a wonderful summer or winter, depending upon where you are. And I hope you have a wonderful day and I hope to see you next month. All right. Bye-bye.